Hello and welcome to the CS4 interview. Joining me this week is Andy Philippides from the University of Sussex, who later on is going to be talking about insect-inspired route navigation. Andy, welcome. Thanks for coming. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. Well, it's a pleasure as always. Now, um, ants. They're not the most complicated creatures in the world, and some people may assume that the interesting properties that they have are always pretty much at the, the kind of the nest level. So it's about laying little trails and pheromone trails, and as the ants follow each other's trails, then you get this kind of um, stigma G, you get this emergent effect where we, you can look at the colony almost as a, like a super organism. But what you're going to be talking about later on today is that ants individually might actually be quite complicated and we might have a lot to learn from individual ants. Yeah, indeed. I mean, there is, obviously, there is a lot of complexity at the colony level and we can get some incredibly complex um, behaviours from them that we can aim for engineering purposes. But the individual ants, people forget that individual ants are, are, um, are also very sophisticated. A lot of the inspiration for the colony level um, work comes from um, groups of ants, uh, so the army ants, where there are you know, tens of thousands of ants. Um, whereas a lot of colonies, when it's small numbers, you have to do things more as an individual. Okay. So I'm talking more about uh, the species I'm going to be focusing on is um, the Australian desert, ha desert ant. Um, and they are more solitary foragers. Um, they come out, they're peculiar evolutionary niches, they come out when, or ecological niche, is when it's really hot and everything else has died. So okay. they go and pick up other arthropods that have died in the heat. Uh -huh. And um, so um, they're very interesting to us. So, so to step back, I mean, a lot of ants do, I mean, ants do use pheromones. Um, these particular ants don't because the pheromones evaporate, or uh, don't use it for navigation anyway. The pheromones just evaporate in the heat, um, which is primarily why look, we look at them. But, you know, people f don't realise that ants are mainly visual. The ants that do have mm -hmm. eyes tend to use their eyes for navigation. Um, and the reason being that if you're following a chemical trail and you get blown off that trail, you're lost. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're following visual cues and you get blown off, um, the, uh, blown off course, um, then the, um, you can still recover where you need to be going because mm -hmm. in vision, with visual things, the stability is in the world. So um, things like where the sun is? And where the sun is, they'll use where the sun is for the compass, they'll use where trees are. Um, big bushes and rocks and what I'll be talking about later is it looks like I mean they you know, the reason we study ants is because they have small brains they have uh, relatively speaking small brains low visual processing their eyes are pretty poor mm -hmm. um, but they still manage to do very sophisticated things the, the ants that we study go an average of 30 meters to forage which in I mean, body distance is like 16 miles mm -hmm. um, and they're doing this with um, eyes which have maybe a thousand facets so in terms of a camera you know a, a two kilobit picture pretty grainy pretty grainy um, and so it looks likely that they're not really separating the world into objects they're just using the appearance of the world to do this mm -hmm. and so that's why we're, we're looking at those in particular it's kind of one of those beautiful systems where evolution is with as little resource as possible has got a really complex behavior so surely we must be able to understand how they're doing Okay, it. so you've got these relatively simple sensors yep. and a relatively simple brain yep. doing something impressively complicated. Yep. So are you able to peer inside these little organisms and figure out what's going on? You can. That's, that's ongoing work. We're currently looking at that. There hasn't been a lot done. I mean, ants are um, uh, hymenoptera, so they're very closely related. There's kind of a, a proto-wasp, it was the original sort of uh, in the evolutionary thing. I apologise for my evolutionary knowledge, it's not so great. But then you've got bees, wasps and ants, essentially. So ants are kind of like wasp, wingless bees and wasps. Um, and the problem with electrophysiology, as I understand it, has been they've got quite hard heads. <laughs> so oh, right. it's been a lot easier to do things on other uh, on bees. It's a lot more known about the brains of bees, but they're very quite similar to ants. And, and you know, across the insects, really, Things are, are quite well known. So we are, but we have got someone, um, Craig, a student at Sussex, in collaboration. So he's being supervised by Paul Graham and Jeremy Niven, and there, he's going to be looking at what's going on in their brains. Okay. So what other techniques do you um, bring to bear on trying to understand what these ants are doing? Well, I think the the the, the beautiful thing about navigation as a as a behaviour to study is, um, and this is to borrow. 
uh, Tom Collett's phrases. He says that you know, with these ants, because they're all female, they're all sisters, all they care about, they're specialists, they go out to get food, they come back, and they give the food up to the colony, then they go out again, they come back. They're specialists, that's all they want to do, they have no other drive. So when we look at their behaviour in the field, all they care about is getting home. And so the direction that they take gives us a readout of what they want to do. Okay. So their behaviour sort of gives us a direct readout of their brain, if you like, of what, of what they think is going on. You know, there, is, there are no tricks, there's nothing else they want to do, that's all they care about. So we tend to do, or have done, lots of uh, behavioural work, so watching what they do, observing their behaviour, and then, um, because we can't get inside their heads, um, bringing in modelling to make models of what we think might be going on, mm -hmm. and to then to test these models in simulations of these environments or in the natural environment um, to see if what we think is going on is what is actually going on. Okay, so you're actually following ants, is that part? Following ants is a part of the training, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do they have names? I mean, how, do you uh, need to you, tell them apart? Or? Um, you can, in some experiments you do, and you tend to paint them. So you put a little dot, what, a little dot of paint on mm -hmm. their abdomen and on their um, thorax. Uh, different colours so you can tell them apart. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, you will follow individuals. Um, and in the most, I guess, the, the, the most recent work, which is, is looking very promising, but it's in its infancy, we've been able to follow individuals over the whole, whole course of their natural life. Right. Um, albeit a rather artificially short life as we kill them after about four days. Oh. <laughs> right. But they, they will only live about two weeks anyway. Okay. Yeah. Well, depending on the species. Okay. Um, so yeah, but we can, yes, yeah, so we follow individuals um, and typically in the past you would do things, you would grid out the world with bits of, uh, with markers and just mark on a bit of paper where the ant was, was going. Mm -hmm. But importantly for us, we want to know where it's heading, where, where it's facing at any given time. Okay. So yeah, we, and so high speed video has been our friend in this and we've learned a lot from that. Um, we also do experiments, so we do experiments in the natural habitat in Australia and more recently in Seville where there's a kind of um, a, a different species of ant but that works in the same ecological conditions as the Australian desert. Um, and, um, and then in Sussex we have the wood ants uh, who also generally work without pheromones okay. um, because it's too wet. <laughs> no, not too hot. Australia, like it's too hot, yeah, right. it's too wet. And we've got them in the lab, um, and so um, we've got a, a camera set up there where we can track them. Okay. Um, and the, the nice thing again about ants is that you know, these guys, their natural foraging range is probably you know, tens of metres. Um, in the lab, they'll be going a few metres. Mm -hmm. So while it's not the full range, it's still long enough you're going to get something that is similar to the real environment. Mm -hmm. In contrast to, say, a rat, Nothing against people doing work on rats, but mm -hmm. you know, they're they're looking at a couple of meters where they will be going, you know, miles. Okay. So it's a very different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So whereas we've got them in as close as possible to natural. Okay. I would say. So you've got these really interesting field and lab experiments. Mm -hmm. So where does where does the modelling and simulation? Uh, well, the modelling um, comes in, it, uh, as I say, in in sort of it in lieu, or well, it will be as well as the electrophysiology. So it's been known for many years that the way, if an ant or a bee wants to get back to its its nest or a place of interest, it will remember what the world looks like from its nest. And we've got it's got 360 degree view of the world. So you know I'm here. I remember. There's. I just sort of take a picture, if you like. It's not going to be stored as a picture. Mm -hmm. It's known as the snapshot model. It's a bad name, but um, it is it won't be a picture. But there'll be some memory of of this world. And then when I'm away from that, I basically look at, I compare what I'm currently seeing with my memory and the difference tells me um, which way I should go. It's kind of like almost a reverse optic flow sort of thing. So mm -hmm. if I was further away from this, I know there was more red on my right, so I'd move towards the red to make it bigger. Um, you would be in kind of a certain area. It, so you just sort of try and match the picture. Essentially, you just move to make the world look more like your memory. Mm -hmm. Very simple idea. And you can make lots of models of this and you can show it works. Mm -hmm. and it works very well. Um, and it will drive search from anywhere in a local area to the, to the, the goal, um, back to the goal. The important thing is you need to be able to see 
the same things that you could see from the goal. You don't need to be able to see the goal itself, you need to be able to see the, see the same things. Mm -hmm. So if I went around the corner, that visual memory is not going to work. Yeah. So this works very well, so people kind of assumed that would done. They would assume that if you scaled up that, so to do a longer route of say 30 meters or to go around a corner, you would just have one visual memory here and another one here. Like and sign posts. And just chain between, and they were called you know, waypoints essentially. Okay. Um, and um, it's a very attractive idea. We, well, and it seems a logical extension. We actually came to model it. It's a guy called Link Smith who was modeling things um, for his PhD. Mm -hmm. And it was surprisingly difficult to get it to work. Okay. Um, for various reasons. I don't think we'd have uncovered that without modeling. And that's where modeling comes in. And then we look back at the behavior and saw that maybe they were doing something slightly different. There's another way you can use a visual memory. If you're using it in the way that I was talking about it, um, it, it the memory acts like an attractor to the position in space you were at. Um, and it relies on, when I compare what I'm seeing now to my memory, I have to be pointing in the same direction. Because the world looks like this. If I move away, it mm -hmm. moves predictably. But if I mm -hmm. turn this way, everything's changed. Yeah. So you have to be lined up. now. The other way you can use a visual memory is instead of that, if I remember something when I'm facing you, I move away. If I rotate until I find the best match for my memory, I'll be pretty much in the same direction. So in that way, the, the memory is acting like a compass mm. to recall the direction I was in when I was facing, um, when, I, when I was, yeah, so recall the direction when I stored the memory. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of a different way of using the memories. and it, for reasons that I'll go into in the talk and probably shouldn't go on at length here, but these, these are much better for chaining together. You can chain together m m lots of these, and the basic reason being that um, if I have lots of memories from close together, if um, they're telling me the way to go, then um, all the ones that are nearby are probably telling me to go in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I'm remembering, mem if I'm using memories to get me back to different points in space, when I'm between two memories, they're both telling me to go in opposite directions. Mm -hmm. And so you get interference. And maybe you have to remember which ones you've gone past, or things like mm -hmm. that. And essentially you want to spread them out. So it just seems a better, better way of doing routes. Um, and of course you don't need to be lined up in the correct way. You just sort of rotate until you get in the right way. And the, I mentioned earlier that high speed video had been our friend in, in the work in, in that um, when we looked at, or well, I didn't look at uh, Paul and um, Paul Graham and Antoine Wistrach and various other people made some high speed videos of ants uh, in their natural environment. It looked like they were just running straight, but in fact they were pausing and rotating on the spot yeah. at various points. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this, we seem to be a sort of, sort of scanning behaviour which we wanted for our algorithm, which was good. Now it probably turns out that the scanning, that scanning itself, might not be directly related to the algorithm, but the ants normally they have a kind of sinusoidal wiggle they're kind of sampling lots of different environments mm -hmm. and they're constrained to move in the way they're heading so it kind of it seems a much more natural thing to do mm -hmm. um, and this is the i will argue this at great length in the, in the talk so i probably should do now but it's kind of interesting and it's um the modeling forces you to consider um, every detail so it forces you to consider how you implement the movement mm -hmm. and the important thing for an ant point of view is it has to move in the direction it's facing. Now the original snapshot models um, were conceived um, in terms of bees and, and flying insects. Now in there, for them, it's you, you can face a certain way and move a different way. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of having to be constrained to a certain direction made a lot more sense for bees. Yeah. So I think the modeling, you know, modeling has really helped us a lot and um, we've been very fortunate to work with uh, biologists um, such as uh, Tom Collett uh, and, and Paul, um, who are very happy with modelling, very comfortable with modelling and what it can bring. And so, yeah, it's been, a, it's been good so far. Okay, well, that sounds ex excellent. Um, and what would you, I mean, this is an ongoing project, yep. right? So, by the time of the project would be completed, or maybe this work package or this piece of work, yep. is, there, is there an identifiable result or a hypothesis that you want to be able to nail down? Well, I think that where we, where we are at, I mean, in the sense that we, we um, have finished the sort of first phase of this project, if you like, in that the, we've, we've um, so this kind of new style of visual navigation 
has been without wanting to blow one's own trumpet. It has been um, the biologists, a lot of the biologists seem quite happy with it, a lot of the behaviour, people working on that. So there's a small community. Um, but um, it does seem to line up quite well with what's happening in, in the behaviour. So this kind of new way of at least doing the roots seems to be people are thinking, yeah, actually they could be doing it this way, okay. which is quite nice. And, and the, the model we've got of, of route navigation, we think is, is, is novel. It, it seems to... Yeah, it's quite interesting. So that's kind of, we're good with that. Now the next stage is to actually test out whether it's really what they're doing. <laughs> so the, there are two, several aspects to this. The first is, um, as I said, if we can, we need the sort of entire history of an ant, the entire visual history. We need to know where it's been and what it's seen so that we can then um, see whether it's possible for it to have, we can query that visual history and given our model, would, it, would its behaviour be explained by that model, mm -hmm. or do we need something else? So that's one thing, is to sort of nail down some experiments as to whether this is what they're doing, or as is likely, will it be something slightly more complicated, or something involved in some things. The other stage is to look at exactly what, I mean, the, the overall goal from the biology side of things anyway, is, is to um, understand visual learning and memory. When people look at ants and bees because you know, it's a good model in which to understand what a visual memory might be. So when I remember what this world looks like, what is being stored in this series of spiking neurons, it's clearly not a picture. Um, you know, what, is it features of the world? Is it encoded as a whole? Um, how is it recalled? How might two memories interfere? Um, so there's kind of interesting stuff there. So we'd like to get at what features of the world they're actually using. And then we can look at how they might be stored. And then, you know, <laughs> and now they might be recalled. So that's another aspect. And then the third aspect is is to see if we can, um, get, you know, using, use some, uh, to get some engineering out of it to see if we can use these algorithms for robotic navigation um, in various spheres. So it's kind of GPS denied environments, I guess, complex environments, um, wheeled robots, maybe. Um, uh, been looking, investigating applications for sort of uh, space, sort of um, Mars mm -hmm. rover type things. Okay. Um, and yeah, that's so, so pushing it in that direction as well. Mm -hmm. Some applications. Okay. Let's see. That's mightily impressive for such a seemingly simple creature as an ant. Indeed. All right. Well, thanks very much again for your time. I look forward to your talk. And um, when you do have more results, we'd love to hear from you again. Well, Cheers. I'd love to come. It's been very good to be here so far. Thanks All right. Thanks very much. Cheers.